Hi everybody, welcome to Base Habits, episode number 50. This is quite a milestone, so we're gonna celebrate talking about what is probably the most famous bass player on earth, Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney might just be the most famous bass player of all time. Beginning his career in the most popular band ever, The Beatles, and continuing with Wings and as a solo artist, McCartney has revolutionized the role of the bass player, changing the image of the bass guitar forever. I think it's safe to say that pretty much every bassist today owes a lot to Paul, no matter the genre. Over the course of his career, McCartney has shifted between a wide variety of different styles, evolving constantly. This evolution has helped make Paul one of the most enjoyable bass players to listen to in the history of rock music. His bass parts are always interesting, despite their simplicity or complexity. In fact, he's demonstrated how the bass guitar can drive a song in every possible way, from holding down the rhythm with rock-solid grooves to providing melodic hooks that stick in the ears of the listener. He's dabbling in a lot of different styles and the incredible quantity and quality of the music he's produced over the years, making him one of the most revered and versatile bass players ever to pick up the instrument. So let's have a look at some of the main elements of his playing, as usual, we're going to focus only on one part of his career, and that's of course, his time with the Beatles. First of all, his picking technique. Paul was a pick player since day one. It might sound like a no-brainer, but this is an important element in the crafting of the Beatles sound. A bass player with a pick has more attack and more presence, which leads to a better response in the mid-range and upper registers of the bass. Listeners perceive a sharper and more distinct bass tone, and it's easier to hear dynamics, rhythm and phrasing. In the 60s, where there were pretty much no pedals, effects or studio tricks available, it was all down to the player and his hand. We also need to consider that Paul's weapon of choice at the time was his trademark Hofner bass, a hollow body bass that normally has a round and acoustic style tone. On this type of instrument, a good picking technique is crucial in order to get a clear and defined sound. To put it simple, Paul's bass was consistent, loud, clear and distinguishable. I saw her standing there from the band's debut, Please Please Me, is a good example to listen to. Listen to how bouncy and crisp each note is on the bass. The attack and cutting tone of Paul's pick make the bass line the real driving force of the song. Come Together is another good option to hear the way that playing with the pick changes the tone. Every note in the riff is clear and defined. The Beatles' early records prioritized faster tempos and danceable grooves. Paul had to write rhythmic parts that would establish a consistent, tight bass line in order to lock in with drummer Ringo Starr. And that clear picking sound played an important role in it. Number two is chord tones. Learning the chord tones of a given chord is absolutely crucial to play bass like Paul McCartney. A chord tone is a note that exists within a certain chord. So for example, the chord of C major is made from three notes, C, E and G which are called the chord tones. A lot of Paul's early work with the Beatles focused heavily on the chord tones of a particular song, meaning that he played the root, third and fifth of each chord. Nowhere Man is a good example. The bass line Paul played in this song mainly consisted of chordal tones. Under every chord, Paul's bass lines includes the root, third and fifth but playing in a different way for each chord, creating a memorable bass part that gives the recording a fresh sound and never sounds repetitive or predictable. If your song needs a boost of energy, try to emulate Paul's approach in this one. 
You'll enhance the harmonic content of the song while keeping your listeners tapping their foot to its groove. Lovely Rita presents a similar bass line. In constant motion during the verses, Paul gives the song a moving feeling that helps the track stand apart from the typical root fifth bass lines of the era. Hearing a chord tone in the bass register immediately locks the rest of the song around that chord, establishing a clear connection with the listener, even when the guitars play less conventional lines. Number 3. Interact with the vocal line. As the band evolved, instead of backing up the rhythm guitar or just playing the root note of every chord, McCartney began to focus on using the bass to create proper melodies. It's important to underline that the Beatles had no real lead guitar parts, so the bass lines had a lot of space in that sense. On A Day in the Life, Paul's bass line serves as a melodic element, almost like a second vocal melody. I saw the photograph. intro uses a variety of rhythms, quarter notes, half notes, dotted half notes, eighth notes, and so on, showing a more composed line instead of just outlining the chord like he did in Nowhere Man. At times he doesn't even play the root, creating slash chords and adding harmonic complexity to the piece, beautifully interacting with John Lennon's voice. On top, the bass line matches the mood of the song. His choice of different rhythms results in a sort of sleepy vibe that fit perfectly the dreamy image of the first half of the track. During the second part of the song, the waking up section, Paul's playing switches to a steady, rhythmic and march-like bass line that represents the character marching through his day. Other brilliant examples of Paul supporting the vocal melody, as well as interacting with it, are With a Little Help From My Friends and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Before we go on, don't forget to support the channel by hitting subscribe. And if you want to go the extra mile, check out our online store and get yourself one of our beautiful t-shirts. Link in description. Number 4. Chromaticism. If you listen to albums like Sgt. Pepper's, Abbey Road or even Revolver, you hear a stark contrast with the band's first 5 or 6 albums. The band was exploring new sounds and one of the key factors in this transition was Paul's growing use of chromaticism. The best example of chromatic bass line from Paul in the Beatles is definitely something. The bass sets up a counter melody to the vocals and strings, acting like a lower vocal harmony. The melodies on this song are so singable and somehow don't get in the way of George Harrison's vocal line. Many of the most melodic McCartney's bass lines work this way, creating counter melodies and acting like another voice in the song. Paul is often considered the godfather of rock bass, and rightfully so. This video is meant to give you the basics and it just scratches the surface of McCartney's universe. If I had to talk about every cool bass line in the Beatles music, this video would last 3 hours. You name it, he's done it. Simple pop love ballads, fat repetitive bass lines, counter melodies, rocking riffs, hypnotic hooks. Pretty much a complete bass dictionary. His confident attacks, sophisticated rhythms and legendary melodicism still continue to inspire young players to this day. And bear in mind, we just talked about the first few years of his career. On the Beatles' final albums, McCartney reached his apogee and on tracks like I Want You, he provided an unshakable foundation for the heavy guitars and vocals that John Lennon laid on the top. Not only the bass line is so good that the song would work perfectly, even if it had only bass and vocals in it, but it was also a clear precursor to the harder sound that was soon to emerge in the following decades from bands like Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. This is all I had to say about Paul McCartney and the Beatles. I'd like to thank you all for supporting this series and for making its first 50 episodes possible. Thank you very much, follow me on Instagram, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment and I'll see you in the next video.